الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم وغير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يصلون النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا على سيدنا مولانا محمد صلاة تنجينا بها من جميع الأهوال والآفات وتقديرنا بها جميع الحاجات وتطهرنا بها من جميع السيئات وترفعنا بها عندك على الدرجات وتبلغنا بأقصر غيات من جميع الخيرات في الحياة وبعد الممات إنك على كل شيء قدير صلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله Every Prophet, we know from the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu which is in Sayyid Bukhari, where he says that every Prophet warned his people about the judge. And in the hadith then he specifies that indeed Nuh warned his people. And then he says that I tell you something that they did not tell, which is that he is one-eyed and know that, that Allah is not one-eyed. This, of course, is metaphorical. And the reality of Dajjal also is that he is one-eyed and that one of his eyes is, is bad, you know, like a grape, as described by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Many interesting aspects of this that relate to everything that we see today. You know, in order to have depth perception, you have to have two eyes. You can't have depth perception with one eye. Uh, and so, when we look at the fitna of the judge, you know, the, the trials and the tribulations and all of this nonsense that we see, even though he's not here physically, or rather we don't see him physically, but we see his fitna. And his fitna will be here for, for you know, has been here for a long time. He goes through various stages, you know, before his actual coming. But we see, you know, when we look at the world through the eyes of those who see it only from a worldly perspective, it's very limited. It's very narrow-minded. It has no depth perception. Rasulullah sallallahu he also told us that the believer, fear the sight of the believer because he sees through the nur of Allah. You know, he sees far. And not just far, but he sees very deep. He doesn't simply look at the surface of what's going on or the surface of things. This is the characteristic of the believer. Whereas, again, the Jal being one-eyed, he has no depth perception, so he can't see deep. And he doesn't want anybody else seeing deep. And that love of this world blinds that people that follow this mindset so much that even when things are obvious, when things are right in front of them, they can't see it. But then again, you know, it gets back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance in reality. You know, whom he guides, again, those are the believers. And those are the ones who see through his nur. And so they see things very clearly. Uh, and this is why 
Allah SWT described the beautiful face of Rasulullah as, as Doha, what Doha, when he swore by this majestic, beautiful face of Rasulullah SWT, he said that he swears by Doha, Doha being the time in the morning when the light is very clear. You know, you can see things like when early morning, you know, you can't really see things very clearly. Easy to mistake things. But then as the sun comes up even further, now you see things very clearly. But Doha is that time when you see things clearly, everything's bright, but it's not hot. Everything is pleasant. You know? The morning is still very pleasant. This is the analogy to the face of Rasulullah Whoever sees him, whoever looks upon him with love and affection, Allah subhanahu wa gives him the sight to be able to see things clearly with no distortion. This is also why when Dajjal comes, it will be written on his forehead, Kafir. But not everybody will be able to see it. Only the believers will be able to see it. And even those believers who are illiterate will be able to see it and know what it is. But all of those who have no faith, who have no guidance, they will look at him and they will see nothing. And even when we look at the description that Rasulullah Sallallahu gave of him, and a few points here to understand. Well, Dajjal, of course, he is Masih Dajjal. He is the appointed one, and Dajjal meaning deceiver. The illusion. You know, he gives this illusion of something good. In English or in Christianity, they refer to him as Antichrist. Of course, the problem is that most people don't know English. The anti here is actually from the Greek. Doesn't mean that he is against Christ. Anti here means imposter. He will be that imposter posing as Christ for them. He, again, will, for those who have no faith, everything will become distorted, which it already is. And Allah Spata refers to various people as summum bukman umyum fahum la yarjeun. Deaf, dumb, and blind, without guidance. Rasulullah also described him as short and stocky. There's in the narration where he sees him making tawaf. You know, Rasulullah also in the dream, he sees him making tawaf on the shoulders of two men. Which means that his fitna will enter there, which it already has. Even though he himself physically will never be able to enter Makkah or Medina Munawar. But his fitna is already there. And he describes and he gives a description of him. And then he also sees Isa al -Islam making tawaf. And of course, Isa al -Islam, you know, the description of him is very beautiful, handsome man. Yet when he comes, the masses will follow the judge. You know, another important thing to remember that most of us also forget when we talk about the Jad is he will come at a time when no will, when when talk of him will be very limited. Very few people will to be talking about him, which also really obviously tells us that it's not today. But 
But that goes for both non-Muslims and not Muslims who will not be talking about him much. Muslims will not be talking about him very much because he's going to come after the appearance of Imam Mahdi. You know, if you look at the narration, the hadith, you know, when Imam Mahdi comes, you know, he will defeat that army, and then he will go and con conquer Constantinople. And there will be no fighting when he conquers Constantinople. He will say takbir and one of the walls will fall and he'll say takbir and the other wall will fall and the people will be ready to accept him. But then his army will lay down their weapons thinking, oh, things are, everything's at peace. And then a caller will call out that the Jad has come and he's taken his place with your families. And when they come out, they'll find out that it was a lie. But then he, shortly right after that, then he will actually come. The deception you know, of Dajjal again is everything will be the opposite. So what is good will be bad, and what is bad will be good. And we see this as we see the fitna increasing. Things literally that were considered an abomination 20 years ago. Now, if you say something against that, you're considered crazy. I mean, we're seeing this happen in front of us. All of these things that used to be, oh, you know, this is bad, is now considered normal. And things which were normal are now considered bad. We see also, Rasulullah also told us that whoever opposes him will fall into a lot of difficulty, if not outright killed. And those who side with him will prosper from a worldly standpoint. Again, we're seeing the same thing now. You know, we see this system that's in place, and whoever opposes the system whether it's a country opposing the system or individuals opposing the system, then what happens to them? And if it's a government opposing the system, then suddenly that government disappears. Yeah. Or their finances, you know, their money that was worth so much now is worth nothing. He will control the food supply. To the extent that those who oppose him, there won't be any rain in those areas. And those who side with him and favor him will be have abundance. And we're seeing this, this is something that, that <coughs> rulers have done for years the ways that they do it have changed. You know, it's like killing each other, you know. This is something that, that armies and governments have done, killing people randomly for years. The only difference now is that they're much more uh, efficient at it. Controlling the food supply, you know, when India took over, I mean, when, when uh, the British took over India, they triggered 44 different famines. You control the food, you control the people. Here in the United States, you know, when they were conquering the West, they killed 30 million bison. Not to eat, not to use their skins, but that was the staple food of the native people. 
You eliminate the food, you control the people. You know, when you look at what they did in the Middle East, in North Africa, you know, when I was in college, I was talking to a friend of mine from Algeria, and we were just talking, and he was talking about some old man he was talking to, and he asked him what something ch tasted like, and he said, oh, it tastes like cat. You know, this is a Muslim man talking. He said, how do you know what cat tastes like? And he says, well, when, when the French were there, you know, a couple of things. One is that if you wanted water, you know, basically everybody was treated like a slave. You wanted water, and they would urinate in the water first before they'd give it to you. And of course, food, you got whatever you could. Most people were starving. You know, so if they found a cat, they ate the cat. What else could they do? Yeah. So again, these are things that, they, that have been happening for generations now, for centuries actually. The difference now is that they're just more efficient at it. You know, it's like, oh, we're gonna cut off your food supply. You know, it's like, the interesting thing is, here, who owns most of the farmland now? All these big corporations run by people who are truly the enemies of Allah and his messenger. Said Allah the same. You know, they not only own the farmland, they own the seeds. You know, they have patents on the seeds, so like soy, soy is a simple example, Mon uh, Monsanto owns the patent on seeds, soy seeds. No one can plant soy unless it's from them. And their soy seed, you can't replant it, because once you plant it once, that's it. What you get out of that cannot be replanted. So you have to buy it from them. And the same thing that they're doing with various other crops. This is also why there's this war on, on meat. You know, of course, all of this is under the, the disguise of global warming, but they want to get rid of meat. Everything's got to be, you know, plant-based because the plants are easier to control. You know, it's interesting, Hudayfa bin Yaman, radiallahu he is the one companion of Rasulullah. Wasallam, who would ask him about the difficult times. He himself said that all the other companions would ask about the good to come. And I would ask about the difficulties to come. But he wouldn't simply ask about the difficulties. He'd also ask, if I find myself at that time, what do I do? And Rasulullah Wasallam, when he was telling him about all of these difficult times to come, and especially what we're seeing today, he said, what do I do? He said, if you have land, then go and stay at your land. And if you have animals, stay with your animals. You know, we see what they're doing. And again, this is, this is simply an introduction to the fitna of Dajjal, is what we're seeing today. This is practice run for when he, you know, when he shows himself, when everything is set for him. This is just practice run. You wipe out a whole people, I guess nothing. Again, control the food, control the water, control everything. To the extent if someone says anything, you know, you cancel them. Like they don't exist. You know, the other interesting thing, yeah, there are many interesting things. 
But of course, you know, when Dajjal comes, he will show the people many things. Miracles. You know, the problem in English is that, uh, uh, you know, if you want to talk about something that should be impossible that happens, the only term that, that, that exists really is miracle. In Islam, we have various terms, depending on who's doing what. You know, but everything is under the control of Allah. But of course, you know, if a prophet does it, it's mujza. If the follower of a prophet does it, it's kirama. And the interesting about kirama is that the kirama is in line with the miracles of the prophet that he follows. And the Quran shows us this in the, sur in the story of Sulaiman alayhi salam. You know, when we read the story, when, when you know, the throne of Bilqis is brought to the court of Sulaiman alayhi salam, first, you know, if read the type of the huge jinn, he said that I will bring it before you dismiss your court. And then Asif bin Barkhia, his name is not in the Quran, but we know from the Hadith that his name was Asif bin Barkhia, who is this companion of Sulaiman al Islam. He, say, he says, I will bring it before you're even able to look. And Sulaiman al Islam, or, uh, I will bring it before you blink your eye. And when Sulaiman al Islam looks, it's already there. And al Asmatha mentions about Asif, what? He says that he has, he had some knowledge of the book. <coughs> but if I look at the miracle that he did, from the knowledge that he had from the book, is in line with the miracles of Sulaiman al -Islam. You know, we read the various miracles that Sulaiman al -Islam performed. Most of them were somehow connect, con connected to teleportation, moving people from one place to another place. Which is also why the miracles of the only Allah of this Ummah are unlimited, just as the miracles of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi are unlimited. They're not limited to this world only. But then there's also the term of istadraj, which is what the miracles or the events that should be impossible when some non-Muslim does something. Allah SWT allows them to do certain things. There's Mu'awnat, which is where a common Muslim, Allah SWT, performs something because of a common Muslim, something that should be impossible. But then there's Ahanat, which is where someone claiming to be a prophet tries to do something, and the opposite happens. Musayma is the easy example of that. You know, Musalma, he claimed to be a prophet. And one time, and many things happened, but simple example. You know, one of the people in, in his group, he said, oh, see, Rasulullah so some so-and-so came and he was blind in one eye and he, and he put his saliva in that eye and he could see. So Musalma says, ah, oh, I can do the same thing. So he calls one of his followers who's blind in one eye, and he spat in that eye, and the other eye went blind. This is because Allah subhanahu wa does not allow anyone to touch the, 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 the office of prophethood. Because if he allowed that to happen, for someone claiming to be a prophet to do things that are unusual, then many people would go astray. But if someone claims to be God, then he allows them to do many things. Which is why when Dajjal comes, he will do many things. And we know from the hadith that he will kill the scholar and then he will bring him back. He will cut the scholar in two and then bring him back. And many other things. Because if someone is stupid enough to believe that someone he can see and touch and feel 
and someone he can comprehend is God, I mean, he's already gone. Which is why, again, when Dajjal comes, he will do all of these things. And as I said earlier, he will control the food supply so that, you know, people that have crops who oppose him, there will be no rain for them. And those who side with him, they will have plenty of rain. And those who side with him say, oh, this is proof as to who he is. The, if he had claimed to be a prophet, then none of this would, Allah SWT would not allow any of this to happen. But again, if someone, you know, if his mindset is so messed up that he's willing to accept anything from the creation as God, I mean, there's no help for such people. And which is why Allah SWT says, if you want to go that way, go that way. But we're seeing again all of this play out. What do they do? First thing, anyone who opposes them, we're cutting off your food, we're cutting off your electricity, we're cutting off your water. And then those who aren't dying from starvation will kill you another way. Until we force you into compliance. The more dangerous aspect than this though is, those of us who aren't going through any of that, who have this illusion that oh we're safe, and because we're safe, you know, this is only there, this is only them. We become complicit and we also start justifying or rather siding with those who are complicit. Even if we don't justify it, we side with those who are complicit. Even though, in reality, even those that are complicit aren't really complicit by definition. Complicit simply means, okay, you're not doing anything. Those that are claiming to be complicit, or even those that are being accused of being complicit these days, they're actually helping the other side. And these, you know, and that is the situation where Allah Subhanahu takes the Iman away and the person doesn't even know it. You know, if someone is disrespectful to Rasulullah, so awesome, claiming to be Muslim, Allah Subhanahu takes his Iman and he doesn't know it, which means he can't make Tawbah. Read Surah Hujrat, it's right at the beginning. It's right there. And to not care about the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam means that we have excluded ourselves from that Ummah. This is also why Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us you know, to make dua for the protection from the fitna of Dajjal. Because this is again what we're seeing. He also told us to read Surah, Surah Kahf in the first 10 verses or the last 10 verses or the first 10 verses and the last 10 verses for protection from Dajjal. But it helps to understand what the connection between those verses and Dajjal is. Because most people when they read the verses, they don't see any connection. And I don't have time to go into that. Maybe I'll go into that next week, inshallah. We'll see. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and protect our brothers and sisters in Gaza and in Philistine, throughout Philistine. Because everything's a deception. Everything, you know, there's something going on behind the curtain. 
And while they're doing one thing over here, they're doing many things very, every place else. So many laws have been enacted, even in the World Health Organization. It's very interesting, you know, when you start analyzing all of this stuff. Even, you know, these organizations that are supposed to be for the good of humanity. Of course, anything appointed by the UN is not for the good of humanity. And the World Health Organization is also a branch of the UN. You know, people think the name, oh, you know. But all these laws that are being enacted has nothing to do with what's good for the people, but has everything to do with controlling everyone and making the people do what they want them to do. You know, when COVID was going on, the bombings in Yemen, the bombings in Sham, the bombings in the Muslim world never stopped. In fact, they increased. You know, the goings on you know, in Sudan and, and various other aspects or places never stopped but they increased. Everything was used as a cover to do something else. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to open our eyes of the heart and to be able to see these things and give us protection and protect our brothers and sisters in Palestine and Kashmir and every place else where the Muslims are being oppressed. Uh, and may he protect those who are being oppressed and may he destroy those who are oppressing. Uh, and may he fill our hearts with the love of his truth, of his his family, his companions, and all of those whom they love, those who have not made sunnah go and make sunnah.